In this episode of the Business of E-Commerce, I talk with Mike Sell. This is the Business of E-Commerce, episode 30. Welcome to the Business of E-Commerce, the podcast that helps e-commerce retailers start, launch, and grow their e-commerce business. I'm your host, Charles Pulaski. I'm here today with Mike Sell. Mike, Sell. Mike is the co-founder of Sunday Scaries, a product that he developed to help him and his co-founder cope with the stress of running multiple businesses. I wanted to chat with Mike a bit today about his journey into e-commerce. So, hey, Mike, how are you doing today? Good, Charles. How are you doing? Doing good. Thanks for coming on the show. It, um, it's always interesting to hear, you know, kind of folks' journey into e-commerce, how they got started and everything. So definitely uh, glad to have you on. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So can you tell just Sunday Scaries, what exactly is it and how would you kind of describe it? So Sunday Scaries are CBD gummies uh, that are that are custom formulated for anxiety. We incorporate vitamins B12 and D3 uh, as mood boosters and also just to increase the bioavailability of the 10 milligrams of CBD per gummy. Um, you know, we work really hard to get the gummies to taste it's amazing, but we also wanted to uh, manufacturing consistent dosing of the full spectrum CBD every time just to ensure the, the reliable efficacy. And we do that through the gummies because usually if it's like a tincture or a vape pen, it's kind of hard to regulate how much intake you have. Okay. So C in, so for folks who don't know, CBD, CBD, we said, what exactly is that? What does it stand for? Uh, CBD is uh, short for cannabidiol, and it's uh, it's a cannabinoid, which is a compound that's found in the hemp and marijuana plants. Uh, there's over 80 cannabinoids in the plants, and the two predominant ones are CBD and then THC, which is tetrahydrocannabinol. So THC is obviously the one that's that's psychoactive, the one that that gets you high. CBD is its base, basically its non-psychoactive sister. It has all the therapeutic benefits, uh, most of the th- therapeutic benefits that you'll find within, within the plants. Okay. So is C- CBD, is that something that um, you need to be in one of the states where marijuana is legal or is this like available everywhere? It depends where you source the CBD. So with Sunday Scaries, we're able to ship to all 50 states within the U.S., and we do this because we we're, we're allowed to do this because we source our CBD through industrial hemp. It's extracted through industrial hemp rather than being extracted through marijuana. So there's a 2014 farm bill uh, that basically says that if you're getting you know, CBD from the mature stocks of the industrial hemp plants, um, then it could be interpreted as being as being legal. Um, while, while marijuana, I think, is uh, legal in what 13 states now. Uh, it's all obviously still federally illegal, so we don't source our CBD from marijuana. We source it from hemp. Okay, so long story short, it's a gummy bear that has some derivative type chemical from not marijuana, but something marijuana ish, and it helps with anxiety. Is that somewhat correct? Yeah, if it's from hemp, and yes, it helps with anxiety. I mean, CBD is a, is a miracle compound. It's It can honestly help with so many other things besides uh, anxiety. We just targeted anxiety in our our, um, whole whole marketing platform, and then we incorporated that those other vitamins in order to help with anxiety as well. But CBD can help with with, um, people use it for skin care, for sleep aid. Uh, It's given to kids with epilepsy that have seizures, kids and adults with epilepsy that have seizures. Uh, Because it helps stop the seizure. Uh, It's given to kids with autism to help kind of regulate their behavior. So there's a wide array of of different benefits of CBD. We just concentrate on anxiety. Hmm. Okay. So how did you actually get into this? How did you decide to do this? Um, You said you were running another business and kind of there was some stress of doing both. So what actually kind of was the the basis for beginning all this? Yeah, so we own a neighborhood sports bar here in San Diego called Project Bar and Grill. And we were looking to open up another brick and mortar establishment, another bar. And throughout the process, it's just um, there's there's a lot of moving parts and there's a lot of small fires that you have to deal with. So it's very it's extremely stressful, you know, all the way from 
the startup process with raising funds and building, you know, your, your, your business, um, your whole business idea, and then taking that all the way through with, you know, a business purchase agreement and signing a lease. It's just a very, it's just very stressful. Um, so throughout the, the process, we were talking to one of our really good friends, Garrett, um, and he's a, a financial guy, he's a financial advisor, and he was telling us about CBD. And he takes, he drinks a lot of coffee in the morning and sometimes he gets jitters and gets a little stressed or anxious and he found CBD and it kind of mellowed him out, it balanced him out and allowed him to focus. So we started taking CBD in different forms from everything from effervescent tablets to tinctures, uh, to different kinds of edibles, to vape pens, um, and we just fell in love with it. Hmm. Okay, so then how long, so actually, did you ever end up opening the second location, or is that still something you work no, on? No, so, so we pivoted. So during the middle of the whole process is when we found CBD, and you know, Bo, Bo and I looked at each other, and we're like, you know, we love this stuff. How can we figure out a way to develop a product on our own and sell it online? And one of the biggest things that we found uh, just within, you know, different brands that are that are selling CBD is, you know, there was a lot of it was very hard to find information on dosing, on reliable ingredients, on whether they were produced in a you know, GMP facility. And it wasn't a lot of the different products weren't marketed very well in our opinion. So we took a different approach. We kind of tried to make a lifestyle brand out of it rather than call it canna something or, you know, CBD something. And, and we kind of put a fun, a fun little twist on it while, while we marketed it. Yeah. It's funny when I was doing the research, I actually didn't know what CBD was. So I had no idea until you just said that, um, now. So to the, uh, to the layman that, um, yeah, they just look like little gummy bears in the pictures. So, they, yeah. Now, sorry, go is, ahead. Is it marketed as food, a vitamin, a supplement? Like, what where does it kind of fall in the actual, you know, food and drug eyes? Yeah, so it would be like it would be like a supplement. Okay. Um, yeah. So, so relatively it's, it's lower regulations, right? Supplements. My understanding. Yeah, it's, just, it's intended for people with with daily use as needed. Uh, is is what we say on the bottles? Two to three gummies as needed. When you're feeling, you know, stress, when you're feeling that that acute anxiety, that that onset of uh, anxiety that you get. Yep. Okay. So now, you were opening the second location. Ended up saying, you know, okay, wow, maybe this is what we should do instead of opening up a second location. Um, started trying some different things, and you kind of stumbled upon the whole um, gummy um, way of distributing it. Is that kind of how it went? Yeah, well, I mean, we, we sat down at a table and, you know, we got out our whiteboard and we started jotting down, you know, what kind of products um, that, how, how do we want to administer the CBD, right? And so there's different ways, kind of like how I already discussed, there's the tinctures, um, there's the vape pens, there's different kinds of edibles, there's even, you know, topical lotions for CBD. And we figured that... You know, from what we just talked about, there's a lot of consumer education behind it, and there's some stigma, I think, to people dropping some tinctures underneath their tongue or to, you know, smoking a vape pen in order to get the CBD. So we wanted to find the most approachable way, and everybody loves a gummy bear, uh, so we kind of settled on that. And also, you know, when somebody's stressed out at work, uh, they need to meet a deadline, or you know, they're they're working on a report that they need to hand over to their boss, you know, if they're at work uh, or in a social situation, it's a lot easier to take out your purse or take out a bottle from your backpack and, and pop a gummy or two than it is to, you know, start smoking a vape pen in the middle of your, you know, your office. So and, and yeah, in the middle of the, uh, the Monday morning stand up, I don't think people want to, uh, <laughs> I've, I've actually had people do that before. It's a little odd. Um, and I, I don't think, uh, I don't think appropriate in most places, but I have seen people do that. So yeah, exactly. And the, the bottle creates intrigue. I think the branding is really special. So when people look at the bottle, it's this dark bottle, you know, um, that uh, that is almost scary in a way. But when you actually open it up, it's these colorful little bears that make you feel um, like everything's going to be OK. So that's that's our playful take on acute anxiety is that. Do you have one there by any chance? Hold up to the camera. Do you have one by any chance? 
I don't on me. I can go grab. Uh, that's, that, we'll put a picture in the show notes, but it, um, I was looking through it originally. It looked, it looked cool the way you're describing it. So cool. Well, yeah, thank you. Yeah, people people really love the branding, so we're happy about that. Okay, so you decided gummies. Um, here's the active ingredient. How did you actually get started? Like, how did you do this? So now you have this idea, but where do you go from there to actually get it produced, manufactured, packaged? I and mean, how do you kind of how do you start down that road? That was actually, it's a good question. That was one of the hardest parts, actually, because there's obviously a lot of manufacturers uh, for gummy bears, but in order to find ones that would deal with CBD, it was really hard. We ran into the situation where we either had, you know, these hippie producers that were making it in their garage, which obviously we don't really want to, you know, trust that, <laughs> that type of facility and sell a product that's made like that. And then on the opposite side of the spectrum, you have Haribo or some of the bigger gummy manufacturers that are doing gummy bears without the CBD that don't want to touch the custom formulation because of the gray area surrounding the CBD. But they're the ones with the, with the facilities that you could trust. They have the facilities. They have the volume. They can actually, you know, they could get, you know, essentially any quantity you want um, and they can scale, but you can't bring that chemical into their facilities. Exactly. And, and, yeah. the, and the consistency and the consistency is there, which is huge for us as well. So we just had to do a lot of research. Um, it was a lot of a lot of pounding the pavement and talking to different networking groups. And finally, we found somebody that not only had an amazingly clean and efficient facility, but the product is just unbelievable. And you know, to this to this day, we still can't find a gummy bear that can hold a candle to the one that we have. So we're really, we're really excited and we really stand behind our product. Hmm. How long did that take to actually, from the time you got the idea, let's do this, to when you actually found the facility? How long did that whole search take you? The, the idea for us doing a CBD product was July of last year when it came to fruition. And then we worked on it and got the product market in October. Okay, so you go to this uh, facility. Are they in California or uh, somewhere else in the U.S.? I'm guessing U.S.-based. Yeah, they're, they're, they're local. So they're in San Marcos, a little bit north of us. So once you um, found the facility, what's the process like of actually talking to them and determining what the formula should be? And do you decide that? Do they come to you? Um, or how does that process work? Yeah, so once we found, I mean, once we got the you know word of mouth that these guys were the right guys, we went to go check out their facility. And they also make... Um, they also make other products, and then we just worked with them on on find on sourcing the the CBD that we needed with absolutely you know no THC in it, and we actually do like a proprietary blend of uh, isolate and full spectrum oil. So we just kind of worked on some on some R and D, and then uh, ended up getting getting the gummy that we wanted. I mean, it was just it was just literally making phone calls and it was a vetting process. We had a spreadsheet and if somebody didn't fit to the standards then we'd cross them out. If somebody was too expensive or the gummy quality wasn't there, we'd, we, we'd move on from them. Um, and and finally we fell on, we fell on the custom formula that we really like. Okay. So you start working with them, you get the custom formula. I'm guessing you go back and forth with some, you know, samples, some little, some small runs and you can kind of see, okay, what's this going to look like? What's this actually going to taste like? Um, label design, all things like that. You kind of go back and forth with the manufacturer on. And then at some point you have to kind of, Oh, what was that? They were, they were responsible for just the, the custom formulation for just the actual, the actual product, the actual gummy bears, the, the bottling facility that we use is completely separate. Um, and they, they drop ship our bottles and get our labels printed on. So I actually had one of my best friends from, from college, his name is Ben's Weifler. He actually owns Pup Box, which is a really cool subscription uh, base. You know, uh, they, they sell it, send um, monthly boxes to, to people with puppies and they cut custom design the actual boxes for the puppies. But he is really good with design. So he helped us out with the logo. And then, you know, we just had to get the supplement facts together, made sure that we uh, had all the appropriate warnings and so forth. And then we got that designed and the, the bottling company that we use um, next to their facility is a labeling facility. So um, they're able to just print the labels on and then ship us the bottles for us to, to go pack. Okay. So then you get to get manufactured at one place and then they're shipped over to a bottling facility. Um, do you guys do that or is it someone in between that does that for you? We, yeah, we do the bottling. Okay. Oh, you do the bottling. It's like you physically do it yourself. 
Yeah, we don't we don't cuss. I, I don't do it myself, no. But we have co-packers that do it. Okay, so the co-packers. So you ship the bottles to the co-packers. You ship the labels to the co-packers. You ship the gummies to the co-packers, and they assemble it everything on site. The labels are already on the bottles, but yes. Okay. Yeah. Oh wow. So this is a. Uh, now is this label application is like a lot harder than you think it would be. It's it's not it's not fun trying to put you know labels on thousands and thousands of bottles. It's actually nightmarish. I've bought some very uh, small run product, like some very like custom products um, for different things before. And you get the labels, and it's always like this like crooked thing, and you're like, who put this on? And then I've done it before. Where you try to actually put it on yourself, and you're like, oh wow, it's actually not easy. But, um, you know, putting a label on straight apparently is a, a difficult thing. Yeah, we have a machine do it, and honestly, we we need that to happen too, because with CBD and some of the products that we found. You don't want to, it's already, people are already skeptical about CBD. And when you get a package and the labels on crooked, I mean, it's just not a good look from the get go. I think it just has a, such a bad impression. And, you know, we take all the necessary steps to make sure that we have a clean and effective product. And we want that to show all the way through our branding. Yeah. And that's, that's important, right? Because it sounds like your entire, um, the brand is not to look like it was built in a garage or some, you know, like hippie in the back of a van sort of thing it looks like a product look like it looks like an actual food product you would see on you know a store shelf so yeah we're, we're on store shelves too um majority of our sales come from online but we're, we're in um some supplement stores we're in nutrimart and uh we're actually been featuring a couple dispensaries as well uh, as well as some stores in, in in los angeles so high majority of our sales are online but uh but yeah we're on store shelves as well so Okay. So then you guys, so I'm still trying to make sure I get this process. They, someone actually comes up with the, you know, the gummies themselves. Those get shipped to a co-packer bottles, the labeling company ships the labels to the, the bottling company. They put that together, ship you the bottles, co-packer assembles it. And then you're essentially drop shipping it out of the co-packer from there. Correct. Um, no, we handle the shipping too. So yeah, so we just pay, um, the packer, and then uh, we have somebody on site that that prints the labels. The labels are just generated from our website. When people, when somebody places an order, we uh, we use a shipping system, and it just we print out the orders on on label paper, and then we get we just bulk order uh, envelopes of different sizes, and then we just have to manually punch in. Um, uh, you know, if, if there's any sort of changes on, on a bottle, uh, just the amount, it's basically weight when you're shipping. So it's the price is determined upon weight. And then we just print those labels out and, and drop the, the actual bottle in and ship them off. Hmm. Now, did you or your co-founder have any experience with anything like this before you started? Or was this like the very first time you just figured out as you went? Well, we've had experience with, with, you know, operational stuff and running a business and, you know, we had some contacts with regards to, to PR and to some like website developers and so forth. So it wasn't like completely out of thin air, but I mean, doing and starting an online business is way different from brick and mortar. But to be honest with you, the, the types of, of obstacles and fires that we deal with at the bar versus with you know, Sunday scares the gummies. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a lot harder operating a bar. <laughs> it's, there's a lot more variables. You have employees, you have a lot more overhead. So we, we prepared ourselves. We took ourselves through, um, you know, business school by opening, by opening up the bar. Yeah. So it sounds like that, that gave you like the, the business background to basically be able to go through and figure out this logistics of how to actually get this produced and shipped and bottled and labeled. And, um, you know, actually figure out, basically gave you kind of the background to be able to figure out how to do all these steps. Yeah, definitely. How long did that take to get to, the, so to get to the point of, you have the very first bottle, like how much time or even money, or, like what did it take to actually get to that? Um, you know, and people, do, and just trying to get an idea if people just starting off, you know, should they expect this as like a, a thing that takes a couple of months or are we talking years? Or like what kind of, what can they expect from that? Honestly, I think it just depends on the person. Um, I mean, Bo and I are, are hustlers, so we we per obviously families first, but right after that is uh, is work for us, you know. So 
we we work tirelessly in order to to execute the projects that we have. So it just depends on how much work you put in, uh, and depends on what you're trying to do too. I think if you know we were trying to to build our own vape pen and we had to get it, you know, designed and crafted, uh, then it probably would have taken longer. Um, you know, so it just kind of depends on, on what road you take as well. Um, and, and just how well you can execute everything. So luckily I have Bo who's an amazing partner and the stuff that, that I'm not very good at, he takes on and and vice versa. And we know when to delegate too. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a designer, so I'm not going to get on illustrator and try to make my own label, which would take me a month and it'd probably come out looking like crap. I'm going to make sure to raise enough money, um, and budget out so I can hire on the appropriate talent to take that over. So I, I think that's one of the biggest things is you don't want to get founderitis, uh, where you're doing everything yourself because you know, you kind of want to make sure, make sure to micromanage, make sure everything's done perfectly. Sometimes it's better to know what you're not good at and delegate that out. So, uh, so it can be executed on a timely manner and then just come out looking awesome. So. Yeah. And probably, I bet the experience of having a bar kind of, it teaches you early that you, you have to hire folks is really, you know, and that sort of business, it's not like you and your co-founder could just kind of run it yourselves. You need staff there. So you probably get in the mode of hiring, figuring out what you should be doing, what you shouldn't be doing. And that probably helps give you that background of, um, you know, being able to delegate. Yep, exactly. Yeah. I mean, that's, we can't do everything by ourselves and here at the bar, you know, we hire on our bartenders and managers are, just their workhorses and they're really good at what they do. I mean, if I try to get behind the bar, I can make some vodka sodas or some Jack and Cokes. But if you ask for a really good cocktail, I'll, uh, I'll defer to one of our guys who, who make outstanding drinks, you know, and I'd rather have them behind the bar than have me behind the bar. So yeah, we definitely applied that same logic to, to the gummy business. And like I said, you know, one, one of the biggest things for us too is copy, just writing different blogs or, just writing, you know, diff- different stuff. Like, let's say on our website, um, you know, I'm, I consider myself a pretty good writer, but it's not my uh, my number one forte. And I'd rather not spend my time, you know, two to three hours writing copy for a page on our website when I can hire somebody to do it faster and better than I can. So uh, we like to concentrate on the product, concentrate on the customer, concentrate on the idea, and then we're the glue that puts everything together. So. Yep. And now, so to get kind of the first version out for you guys, was it, you know, a lot kind of investment wise on you know, bu- building a first product and getting that kind of first run out, you had to buy like a pallet of them, or are we talking, you know, you could buy a, a small, a small box to begin with, or what did that look like? Well, I think it all depends on, um, just kind of, it depends on a couple of different things. And I guess in order to ha- to see how much quantity you're going to get. I mean, we're starting off a new product that's going to launch soon called FOMO Bones, which is going to be a CBD dog treat for, or CBD um, treat for dogs for anxiety, FOMO, FOMO, fear of missing out. And we're getting a lot of positive feedback on that. So now we have a database, you know, we have a, a email list of current customers that already love our product. And we're able to ask them like, hey, would you rather have us come out with a dog product next or would you rather have us come out with an effervescent tablet that you drop in water next? And if all the data shows that they want a dog product and we get huge response to it, then we're probably going to order bigger on the first round. Also, usually there's tiered pricing when you get, um, you know, bulk, you know, wholesale orders from different manufacturers and that goes all the way from the product through, uh, the pouch or whatever um, package you're going to use, the more you get, you know, the less the less you pay. Um, so you also have to take that into into consideration, but you don't want to go overboard overboard either, because then you're then you're just sitting on product that's collecting dust, you know, wherever you're storing it. So, so how how did you decide on the kind of the first run, how big to go? Were you just trying to like the minimums we talking, or did you say let's you know, let's go bigger. I think with, with Sunday scaries, there was just tiered pricing. So I think, you know, that the initial thousand bottles was a certain price after that 2,500 was a certain price after that 5,000 was a certain price. And we felt confident that we can make the 2,500 mark. So we just started there 
because we got a huge break from going from a thousand to twenty five hundred. So we saved a little bit of money and we didn't put ourselves too much at, at risk. It's just a risk reward analysis. You also have to take into consideration on, on how, the, the turnaround because it's not like you just press a button, order, and, and it's like Amazon. You get your your new bottles within you know two days. It takes time for them to process the order at the facility. It takes time for them to ship it to the label applicator. It takes time for us to pack it afterwards. So we need to make sure to always keep tabs on our inventory and we just base it on, we just look at past sales after that and try to measure the amount of growth that growth that we have and, and order enough. But it's it's been a challenge. I mean, we've run out of bottles before. It's not fun. It's not fun. Yeah. I feel like once you have that data, you can start kind of, you know, looking back even historically year by year, um, you know, probably there's certain weeks during the holidays or anything in the, in the winter that sales might drop and then other times where they peak but then that kind of first run how do you how do you get to that 2500 number and do you just is it just i'm pretty confident um we can do this or was there any kind of any kind of information they used to get to that i mean well, well at some point you just got to go in you know um I mean, if you keep, if you have analysis paralysis and you're thinking, oh, I don't know if I could do this, I don't know if I could do this. To be honest with you, if, if we weren't confident that we were going to sell 2,500 bottles of these gummies, then the whole thing wouldn't be worth it at the end anyways. <laughs> you know what I mean? You probably wouldn't have spent so, the months developing the, the gummies in the first place, right? Yeah. You, you got to yeah. have some confidence in yourself and your idea and your product. And like I said, you don't want to go overboard. But if we couldn't sell 2,500, the entire thing would tank anyway, and it wouldn't matter at that point. So it's, sometimes you just got to go in. Um, and I think I think that's the, the biggest thing. And, and it's you, you know you you jump off the cliff and you grow your wings on the way down. Sometimes you don't know all the answers, but you you know you find out as as quick as you can, and and you fail and you pivot. And that's that's what entrepreneurship is all about. Well, and it sounds like a product that you guys uh, like. So worst case, you would have a lifetime supply of gummies that yeah. uh, <laughs> if it hadn't worked. We'll, so, we'll eat all the gummies. We love the gummies, so we'll eat yeah. them. So yeah, would, you could just eat them yourself. So how long did it actually take from the time you say, you know, place the order with the uh, manufacturer to when you actually get them um, where they're ready to actually ship out? What kind of, what's the time there in between? Uh. So wait, are you talking about for the gummies? For the gummies, yeah. From from the time if you place an order for twenty five hundred now, you know when do they actually arrive to you? The biggest lag is with the bottles. The bottles take the longest time. I mean, it takes about two and a half weeks to get the bottles. But we're working with them to start um, having a cert, certain amount of uh, of product on site, stocked specifically for us. So there's no there's no back order. And, uh, you know, I think the higher in volume we get, the more prioritized we are um, within their warehouse, too. So we're working towards that. But that's that's the biggest lag. The gummy turnarounds fairly quickly for us. So so you're talking, though, you have to plan three, four weeks out every time just to kind of know, OK, how much product do we have on the shelves, what rate it's kind of we're going through it and when we have to place another order and how big. Yeah, well, I mean, we're also it's really hard for us because we're almost doubling in sales every month since we started, which has been insane. It's been awesome. But, you know, we try to prepare and uh, and we still end up running out. So now we're just ordering well beyond what we think we're going to do. Um, because sometimes, too, you know, we'll have the month in terms of daily sales will just double so we can, we can kind of foresee that. But if we get featured in, let's say, uh, BuzzFeed, like we did a couple weeks ago, or Mind Body Green a couple weeks before that, or uh, Chive, we got featured in the Chive last night, then we just see this crazy spike in traffic and these crazy spike in orders that we just need to prepare for. So we just kind of over order now. Um, well, and it, you kind of have the flywheel going, right? Well, you know, worst case you over order, it's going to be, you'll have to put in, maybe you'll have stock for two months instead of one at that point. So even if you don't get that pop that month, you can kind of plan out, okay, we're ordering X number a month. It'll just take a little, few more weeks to go through. Um, so it's not, I'm guessing, not as scary now over ordering. Yeah, now that we hit our stride, um, it's it's a lot better for us because we we are confident that we're going to go through the bottles anyways. So we'll over order knowing that we have such good traffic that we'll be able to sell them. 
Whereas before, like, like we discussed, we just didn't know how market would perceive our product. So now, now that we have that information, it's a lot easier for me to process and, you know, an order of, uh, you know, higher quantity amount of bottles and get the price reduced per bottle because we know that we're going to go through them. So, you know, your floor each week, right? So even if you don't get featured in, you know, a Buzzfeed, you're still going to sell X number of bottles. You know that. So either way you can place a big order and know, instead of going through it in two weeks, it might take six or eight, but you'll go through them. Right. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So then you said the sales are kind of split between retail and actually online with just your site. Um, how, which one did you go to first? Was it just online to begin with? And then you went retail? Uh, we did both first because we wanted to see what worked better, but we just like, we like online better because there's, there's better margins and you know, you don't have to get uh, POP, um, or any sort of displays for the stores. You don't have to hand deliver stuff to the stores. Uh, a lot of the, a lot of the different, you know, retailers, they want net 30 terms. So you basically drop off your product and then hope to get paid in 30 days. Where, whereas the model online is you basically put your card information in and you pay and then you get it directly shipped to you. So I think that because there's a couple of different reasons why we like online, but it's the easiest way, you know, we just print labels and ship them and there's not a lot of face to face interaction. If any customers have any sort of like complaint or feedback or they want to write a testimonial because they love our product so much, then we obviously take care of that uh, the fastest way that we can. Uh, and we make sure to give that, that customer response or the customer care and that, that prompt response that they deserve being, being a customer of ours. But it's not the same as dealing with a retailer that's trying to figure out why they're not moving as fast on the shelves or whatever. So there's that. And then the margins are obviously better because we're, we're cutting out, uh, we're cutting out a middleman by selling them online. Yeah. It's almost like a different game. It's almost like a different thing altogether, right? Like retail is its own, has its own set of challenges, its own benefits though. Right. But at the same time, you know, online, like you said, there's definitely perks to go in that way as well. Um, so, but most of your sales are online then, right? To this day? Yeah. Well, San Diego is our second highest selling city um, right behind New York. And so a lot of locals will see our product and will reach out to us via Instagram. They'll shoot us a DM or something. And they're like, hey, I'm going to Coachella this weekend and I want to order a bottle but I know it's going to take, you know, two, three days to get to me. So, uh, you know, is there any other way I can get it? So we always direct them towards, you know, Nutramart, one of the brick and mortar stores where they can go just buy it right away. So that's helpful for us too, because we can, people have access to getting the bottles a lot quicker if they're super stressed out or if they need them for a trip or something like that. Yep. So when you decide to, so let's say, let's focus on the line piece, right? When you decide to, um, cause most folks listening probably do mostly online, um, how did you actually, so you launched it, came out with the site, um, had kind of developed while you're developing the product, I'm guessing. So you kind of, from, by the time you got the product, was the site kind of ready to go and start selling? Uh, yes. Yeah, so, so what was the question? Sorry, I, I didn't really understand that one. Were you kind of building the site itself and the marketing material and everything like that while you were building the product, doing these kind of things both kind of, or like? You never want to go live unless until your, your website is is up and running and completely ready to go. I mean, your, your website is your storefront. So imagine, you know, you walking into a store to go buy a supplement and the lights are off, the aisles are all in disarray and the cash register is not plugged in. And that's the same thing with a website. If you go and you know, the, the, the user interface is off, um, or the design is off, or your plugin, or you know, whatever processor you're using isn't set up yet, then people can't buy your product. They won't know how to buy your product. They'll be confused about how to buy your product, and you'll you'll have a lot of your bounce rate will be really high for people going to your website. So that's the number one thing. And what we were talking about earlier too is I think a lot, a lot of people try to take on the whole website thing themselves. That's one of the biggest things that we're huge advocates on delegating because it's the most important thing. And we've seen that through, uh, you know, we use um, a company called Disruptive um, and they do split testing for us. So they'll, 
basically, you know, get three different options um, from anything to what our call to action is, to the color of our buy now button, to where, uh, you know, different pictures are placed on the screen. And you basically try to optimize your sales by looking at data and conversion rates on, on which split test works the best. We actually had uh, Chris from Disruptive on the show uh, quite a few episodes back, but um, yeah, he talked. He talked. That that wasn't planned actually. That just. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, we. Uh, I've talked to Chris before, um, and he actually talked about split testing, kind of the some things to do there. So it's inter- It's funny you guys use them. Um, they're they're incredible. Um, they've honestly increased sales so much, and. They're very receptive and their feedback is awesome and their communication is awesome. We've been extremely impressed with them so far. Hmm. Okay, good to hear. Uh, that, uh, that, w- that was not planned actually. So so you did they also do all the website development themselves or do they just do kind of the, the, e- the testing side of it? Uh, no, they just do the testing site right now. I mean, they have their own developers, so if we need something fixed, and they can obviously do that. But um, our, they didn't. They didn't originally build our website. No, we actually met them. We went to Social Media Marketing World, which is a um, like a con- big conference at the San Diego Convention Center, and they had a booth set up, and we sat down with them, and they kind of ripped through our site and kind of had some um, original suggestions um, and a, and a hypo- hypothesis of how we could probably sell more by tweaking some things. And we just followed up with them and signed on. And uh, like I said, we don't regret it. So hmm. so then when you actually launch a site, how did you start getting, before even the A-B testing, how do you actually start getting traffic, kind of promoting it? Um, when I was looking online originally, I saw a lot of Instagram stuff on you guys. Is that kind of one of the big channels or like how you act, how you actually getting folks to find out about you? Yeah, that's how we started is just creating funny content on, uh, on Instagram as well as just uh, pictures of, uh, you know, you know, product images. So people kind of created intrigue. Like what is, what is this account? And then obviously we directed it straight to our website um, so that was that. That was the biggest thing. You just target the right in, in individuals, and we also just did a lot of influencer marketing on Instagram. So we were reached out to some influential people that we already knew in San Diego with a big following to take pictures with a bottle or include in the stories of how much the gummies are helping them with the, their particular you know daily stresses that they that they have to deal with. And then eventually, it just goes viral like anything else does. So people tag each other, uh, you know. We give out promo codes so we're able to track what influencers are doing well. And if one influencer is doing well, then we'll pump more product at them and uh, yeah, you know, even just do some paid work if we need to because they're the evangelists. But th- the biggest thing is just making sure that whoever's representing your, pro- your product is actually in love with your product. So we, we always do that. Before we work with anybody, we always send them a bottle from anybody from an, an influencer to our PR firm. And if they don't love the product, we don't work with them because we want them to be true, genuine advocates of, of our brand and our product. So in influence marketing, just so folks that don't know, um, I know it's actually, it's big now, it's big now, but um, it's going to somebody else with a big following and basically some sort of financial compensation where they basically show the product on their social media and kind of tag you guys and then people kind of find you through them. Is that about it? Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot more to it. that's that, that's the summary of it. Yeah, the you basically just reach out, you find somebody that you think would be a good fit for your product. So, you know, and, and that's that's kind of hard. Sometimes you got to test the waters with that because at first we kind of attacked the whole cannabis world and people that were influential. Um, and uh, notable within the cannabis world and that didn't convert as well and then we entered like the health and wellness sector and started looking at people with you know food blogs or that just um advocate like a, advocate like a healthy living and they started converting really well uh we looked at kind of the moms of instagram and they started converting well so you basically just test you throw out some seeds and you see uh you see what sprouts and what doesn't and then you just follow what works and then, you know, pour more time and effort into that. And then once you find something that works, just keep kind of going, branching out from there. Um, it sounds like so. 
Is that still one of your main marketing channels, kind of the whole um, social influencer? Yeah, we still do that. We're, we're doing Facebook ads now. And like I said, we have our uh, PR company that's getting us just put into some publications. So there's articles written about us. So we're doing a lot of different things now, but I think the influencer game is what is what jump started us. Hmm. Okay, that's uh, that's helpful. I feel like that's one of those things that you start hearing about now. But how long ago was that actually when you started when you started doing that? Uh, that was right off the that was right in the beginning. That was um, you know, back in October, November. The thing with us too is that we know we know a lot of people in the bar and uh, restaurant world here in San Diego, a lot of people in the hospitality industry. So when this came about, we actually held a meeting at the bar with, you know, club promoters, bartenders that have a huge following, uh, managers that have been in the game for a while, and we gave them product in order to represent us um, on social media and then obviously just just, you know, hand to hand too. So that was really helpful because our product, you know, kind of is at least originally was surrounded around people that, that like to work hard and play harder. And on the weekends we'll go out drinking, you know, spend too much money, like to party. And then on Sunday would wake up with a moral hangover and, you know, kind of regret some of the, the decisions that they may have made on Friday and Saturday. And then have to prepare for, uh, you know, real life to start over again on, on Monday. So it, it kind of, it worked out that we had those connections already because we we put our product in front of the right audience from the get-go. Yeah, it sounds like having that kind of circle to begin with kind of allows you to jumpstart that. And, okay, you know these folks, and let's kind of expand from the people we know, basically. And even better if you can uh, pay them in product from the beginning. And it's something they like, they're using anyway. So, you know, it works for everyone. That's yeah. great. That definitely, um, yeah, I think this is super helpful. Um, any last kind of things you would say someone just kind of starting off someone who's listened and has an idea and wants to do this, doesn't know where to start. What would you kind of recommend people do or read or listen to, or what should folks do if they have an idea? Are you talking about just for any sort of just idea to, to start a business in general? Or? Uh, I'd, say, I'd say somebody has a product idea. They want to sell online, but not sure how to, this whole, this whole path of how to get it produced, manufactured, shipped, even the site, all, all this stuff, there's a lot of steps that we just kind of went through that, um, you know, looking in the rearview mirror seem kind of obvious, but, you know, before you do them are, I'm imagining even, you know, they're not obvious and it's kind of this like this windy road. So like, where would you recommend somebody that wants to sell a product online? They have a product idea, but no clue from there. Where, where should they start? Um, the biggest thing is just being passionate about your own product. I mean, I, I eat the gummies every day cause I love them and I know that they actually work. And if they didn't, I wouldn't want to stand behind it. You know, for, for the longest time we were trying to do like a, just like a hangover cure and every one that I've ever tried has been snake oil. You know, I take whatever powder or whatever drink it is and it doesn't work. So I don't want to, I stand behind this product and I don't want to go to my friends and family members and be like, you know, Hey, take these gummy bears and have them spend money on it and have them not work. You know, that's not something that I want. I don't want to deal with people returning it all the time. I don't want to deal with people saying that they were dissatisfied with their purchase. So I think the biggest thing is just concentrating on the product because if you have a good product in any industry, then you're going to do well. I mean, same thing goes with here. I parallel to here at the bar. You know, you can have a drink that takes too long to come out. You can have some toilet paper that's on the bathroom. You can have a couple lights that went out or a TV that's broken. But if the food is like the best food that somebody's ever had, they're not going to care about all that other stuff because the product is what is what sells. The product is what people want want to see. So obviously everything I just listed, you want to work on. Same thing with the gummy business. You want to make sure that you have a really good website. You want to make sure that you're marketing it to the right people. You, you, you want to make sure that the branding is on point, but the, the biggest thing is just making sure that you have a product that works and that you stand behind. Awesome. That's very good advice. Focus on product. So that, um, Pro product and customers. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people too will always look at the competition and see what they're doing and try to modify their own business model based on what the competition is doing. But don't look at your competition. Talk to talk directly to the customers that are currently buying you and get their feedback. Send them a survey. 
for a chance to win a free bottle and see what they actually have to say about your product. Most often than not, there's going to be, you know, a, a, if you send out maybe like a five question survey or questionnaire, a lot of times you'll find the answer to your question through there because there's such an overwhelming, you know, yes or no response to certain things that you ask that you can just talk, talk to the people that are already, that already love you, that are already buying your stuff. Awesome. That's great advice. I'll definitely, uh, I like that a lot. So if people want to find you guys, I saw the website, I saw your Instagram. I'll definitely include that. Any other places you'd recommend to kind of people, uh, find you or find out more about you? Yeah. So, uh, just Sunday scaries.com. That's where you can buy the product. We'll ship right to your front doorstep. Um, so that's the easiest way to get it, to get a, uh, to get our product. And then if you want to follow us on social media, our Instagram is for Sunday scaries. It's F O R Sunday scaries. And we post some really funny content on that. So that's the, that's the biggest way to, to, to get a hold of us. Awesome. I'll be sure to link up all that in the show notes. So if anyone wants to find you, I definitely, uh, I definitely appreciate you coming on the show. So, uh, thank you for that. Yeah, definitely. Um, we can also get a, get a promo code set up for you guys if you want that gets your listeners 10% off. So if you want me to do that, just let me know what you want it to be and I can make that happen. Awesome. We will include that. Uh, I'll definitely do that. I'll, I'll link, well, whatever link we do, we'll put in the show notes as well. So, um, yeah, uh, appreciate that. I think, uh, that'll be good to link to. So thank you. Yeah, sounds good. Well, thanks for taking the time and having me on the show. It's, it's really awesome what you're doing.